the FTC had said, you know, if I say it, it's doubtful. When the FTC says it, then people pay attention, right? And lawyers sitting there, you know, any major corporation anywhere in the country hear the FTC say, yes, um, we don't need to have a breach to be in violation. You don't have to have a victim to be in violation. You can just be have a vulnerable data system. Now, and that's where I stop and go, okay, anybody, who doesn't have a vulnerable system? This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. I'm your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Michael J. Doherty, CEO at LabMD. In 2008, we had we were uh, uh, extorted uh, when no one knew. I mean, really, the lexicon of cyber or breach or any of that was not in the public at all. And I was in medicine, and so I went through it when <clears throat> if you said breach, people thought breach birth, and then suddenly out of nowhere, a government agency, the Federal Trade Commission, parachutes in and says, "You're not." Um, you're not complying with Section Five of the FTC Act, which is you're supposed to be um, you're supposed to pr- be reasonable and protect, uh, and they're supposed to protect consumers from uh, deception and unfairness. So, so you had a you had a business then. Uh, could you tell us a little bit. Yeah, I'm the, C- what, what I'm the CEO that, of LabMD, and LabMD is a medical facility in Atlanta that pulled in uh, tissue samples from all over the United States. Wow for prostate cancer and urology and uh, cancer analysis, uh, bacterial analysis, tumor markers. So we were very much in a niche play and only in the uh, only in the medical world, not the political world, the media world or the cyber security or privacy world. And but suddenly I was accused at a time when there was nothing in the lexicon. And my basic question was, well, what do we have to do to be right? What do we have to do to be within the law? And what is the law? And the part where everyone breaks apart and can't believe it, although I think more people believe it today than back then, was that the government said, oh, we don't have any standards. We don't tell you. We don't have to tell you. Uh, The law says you have to be fair. And we decide what fair is on a case-by-case basis. So what is it that they they accused your company? Well, they, 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 company they, they said that, well, someone had given them, which is a, country, a company called Tyversa, which we knew, but they wouldn't admit it for years. Someone had given them a file, a PDF, that was uh, found out in cyberspace, they alleged. We didn't believe it was found in cyberspace. And so, and, and the government, and here's the big dissonance, is that the government, this is what, it's hard hearing this from me because I know people think I'm the victim, so they really discount what I'm saying here. But if you research it, especially now, it's very true. The government had no proof of how that file got out, nor did they care about how that file got out. And so, and everybody that's not involved, which is 99% of the human race, doesn't really care either. You know, they just said, well, look, the file got out. Yeah. How it got out and this was is irrelevant. Nine, 9,000? 9,000 patients. Yeah. And it wasn't their diagnosis. It was their name, uh, uh, their social security number, no address, no phone number. It was name, social security number, diagnosis code, test, uh, and balance that they owed. And so the worst thing they got was their social. But it, but there was nothing no, nothing diagnostically there. Anyway, as far as you know, their medical records. It was all the billing office, which is different servers and everything. Anyway... So it it was a shakedown racket. It was a racket for us. And yet I was back then. It's so different than now. Back then, people didn't even know what cybersecurity was or any of that. And the government started investigating us in 2010. But the part, again, that I say is such a cognitive break with everyone is that they, they just find it hard, as I did, to wrap their head around the fact that the government says you have to be fair and you can't be deceptive. But we don't have to tell you what fair is. 
Now this has blown into a big controversy because now, unlike 10 years ago, companies are spending billions of dollars to be in compliance. Because, and, and then when, 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 when lightning strikes or a fluke happens and you're Home Depot or Equifax or Sony or anyone else, you know, then you're starting dishing out millions and millions. And, and the bigger part is you've got this reputational damage. And that's what, and careers get smashed. The fingers point, start, and the politics just go off the rails. And it's, it's pretty much, you know, you see some of the worst corporate behaviors possible because everyone's in survival mode. But no one's really disclosing what could have been done wrong or what should be done better to help anybody else. You know, the legal departments of all these corporations just shuts everybody up. And really, we don't learn anything. But over, so it slows down. But now what we've learned basically is we're on the other side of that mountain. Now the American public hears Blue Cross lose, you know, 90 million or Equifax is 140 million. Well, the lawyers are going crazy. And, you know, because it's a big, big money opportunity and the privacy crowd's raising hell. But really, the public is like, eh. And it's because what are they going to do? And over time, what real damages have you seen? You know, so so now it's uh, if if this would have happened to me that you, that you would be aware of, right? That well, that, you're pretty uh, much aware that, of someone's that, taking that, your your medical data or they're taking your your charge card, mm -hmm. and most of the stuff is that, right? And so and so you know, and then that's and then you get you have to go to court basically to understand that the definition of damages is not I'm upset, I'm emotional, I'm terrified, I'm anxious. That's not a legal damage. So you really have to have a real damage to go to court. Well, what is a real damage if you don't know that you've been damaged? It doesn't exist. So what, what I learned, and I, I, you know, I didn't know I was going to learn this, but, but I learned that basically we have a, a court system within the agencies that is never taught to anybody in, in, in civics class or anyone in the public that's existed for a century where they get to be judge, jury, and prosecutor. And it doesn't matter to people if it's a corporation because corpor corporations the public is like an artificial person. They have a lot of rights that people's do, they're entities, but they're, they're not, you know, it's, it's even the employees themselves come and go, right? And, but we were very different because we were, we were a medical facility corporation. We had 700,000 cancer patients and they're coming in and they're trashing our reputation and all it takes is doubt. Because you go back to the other, the, the beginning side of the mountain when everyone was freaked out about, they were just phobic about data loss. That was more like six, seven, eight. You know, we're like 9,000 patients sounds like a ton. Mm -hmm. You know, now 140 million, we can't get our head around it. So it seems like almost like, oh, good job. So, so you know, and, and so we're numb to it. But back then it was so reactive. And we're holding cancer stuff. And, mm -hmm. our, and the people that are answering to us are not the patients, it's the physicians sending their patients to us. So because all the deciders uh, in the government who have, who, who can't tell you what the law is, who can't tell you what the standard is, all of them are, are still wanting you to settle so they can tell everyone out in the business world and the privacy world and all the privacy pros and all the privacy lawyers can run to their clients and say, well, the government said you shouldn't do this. Boom, 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 boom. And that's because LabMD allegedly did this. Well, when you say LabMD, which was my company, allegedly does something, you don't focus on the word allegedly. You remove that and you go, LabMD did all this wrong. And I'm the only one sitting there trying to protect my patients. So, because, so, so, so many companies, large companies, when, when they've been, uh, uh, you know, challenged by the FTC for their after a breach, they they've just decided to settle. Um, you know, right. get the twenty years of, of monitoring, pay a fine, and move on. But you decided. Well, the, I had you, one. I had two major differences. You didn't want to do that. There were thirty-seven companies that settled by the time I got hit, and there's about sixty-five by the time I was done. But I'm the only one that fought, and I'm the only one that won. And it's not because I'm the only one that fought. I won for two reasons. Number one, I fought. Well, I fought for two reasons. I fought because there wasn't another medical facility. And I could not let 
a bunch of lawyers in a non-medical agency, this wasn't Health and Human Services, that has no interaction with us ever, has never sent us a pamphlet, has never gone to an industry conference, has done nothing to just parachute in and go, you're unfair, we're going to ruin your reputation, and we're not going to tell you what you had to do. Now, that is utterly unbelievable to most people. When I say that, even today, most people think, okay, Doherty must be holding something back. And I encourage people to research it on their own because there's not an administrative law lawyer in this country that doesn't know what I just said to be absolutely true. But the reason they all settle is because the consequences aren't bad. The reality is you've got a big looming government handing over you. It is cheaper to settle and the reputation damage isn't going to kill you. But when, I was, when I'm diagnosing cancer and I'm a small company, the reputation damage of a consent decree was going to kill us. That was the biggest difference. The other thing was the differentiation of my company was not medical, it was technological. And I had, for 40 employees, I had four tech guys on there because the way we beat the big dogs is our technology, our ordering, our, our ability to get patients their data and results much faster, all, all sorts of things that we did. And so I also, that meant had a really top-notch team. And they were adamant from the day it happened that this was not them stealing it in a normal way. There's no way they used LimeWire or came in. But I've learned that there's nothing less believable to the American public or media than a, a, a CEO of a company saying, I didn't do it. Just mm -hmm. People just don't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, they stare at you. They're quiet. They don't want to get in a confrontation. They politely leave. Because that's the normal response right, after a Right. Breach. They just right. don't want to deal. Well, we didn't know what a breach was back then, so there was no normal response. <laughs> <laughs> so this was like, you know, people did not know what a breach was. It was more like, but people were like, oh, because it's like, cause, because then, because the government was in the press alleging what we did. And they're, they're, they're fascinating. I go on and on about that. But so, so, but we won. We ended up winning. I mean, it took a decade, right? But what happened was I wrote a book. Um, I tried, because I knew no one was going to listen. I knew that long ago. So I knew I had to write the book like an interesting novel to pull people in. That I had to have people looking at more, this is how the government runs, not, oh, look at me. And, and through that, things kind of snowballed into a congressional investigation, and I raised a lot of pro bono uh, defense, like $16 million of, of free legal help. The, I did not understand how much the world wasn't going to get it at the time. I, I really barked up a lot of wrong trees, but that's what happens. You don't know. I mean, I expected a lot of help from the tech industry. I didn't get any. I expected a lot of help from, from um, the legal community. I got a, a little bit, uh, and, but where I got it, I got it big. I got no help from the media, almost no help from politics, except Daryl Issa, really, zip. Um, and so that was very daunting at the time because... I, I, I'm trying to scream loud enough to people pay attention, but I'm trying to get people to pay the right type of attention, which is, this is what they're doing, not to me. This is what they're doing for cybersecurity, and this is who they're damaging, and these are cancer patients. But people just couldn't hear that message because it gets so complicated because they don't know. Mm -hmm. and, it, and there's so many unbelievable things about this. The biggest thing is, here's a law that isn't defined, and they get to make it up after you're accused. So, you know, when I wrote the book, a whistleblower came out and it all turned out to be true and the a government, a report came out and the 11th Circuit awarded my company over $800,000 in damages and put a scathing, scathing report out about the FTC. It would, but it sound, it would sound like I wrote it. It was so, I mean, I really, it's unbelievably scary. So things that the, you were claiming and fighting yes, for but, but when did they, when did they, when did they release that? 2019. You know, this, this is all started in 2008. The company ceased in 2014. So it's a lot to take in. And the fact that it's that big is one of the offenses they use against you. It's like, yeah, you can fight us. You're going to take a decade of your life. You're going to have you're going to have a whole industry mass of people not believe you. You're going to be uh, you're going to be considered guilty till proven innocent. Doubt kills. And so if I was Target, if I was Sony, if I was any of those other companies, I would have settled. Hmm. But I knew, and they, I knew they knew nothing about medicine. They cared nothing about medicine. That I couldn't put a, put, I couldn't allow cancer patients to be part of their, you know, no, notch on their bedpost. 
and um, and I knew that that we were going to lose either way. Like I was going to be dead either way. Mm -hmm. So which way did I want to die? Did I want to die like rolling over and giving up and then no one believing me then? Or did I want to raise holy hell and approve a lot of stuff? Now, I never in a million years thought raising holy hell was going to get me in Business Week, The New Yorker, you know, a book that sold very well, uh, a, a congressional. I mean, you know, if I would have said I'm going to write this book and I'm going to end up in front of Daryl Issa and testifying before in Congress, people would have thought I was really nuts. Me too. But all that stuff happened. It's been pretty amazing. But the book is really what started it all and I haven't written another book since it came out six years ago uh, and I've got two more in me one it's already sort of outlined that I have to get going but I've been so busy in litigation and survival I'm only getting the point now where I can can get it out mm -hmm. so but I've learned a lot and what so, we're going to talk about now is and, lawyers and, and, so, yeah, <laughs> and, and you took up a fight that that a lot of people would feel but um, and I'm sure a lot of those lawyers and the companies had those debates, you know, do we fight this? Do we, you know, do we just, you know, pay it, move on? Um, and, but you, you really, a, a small company took on the FTC? And well, it's situational. Okay, and it's it's all very situational. One of the reasons I uh, in that analysis and strategizing, um, big companies couldn't do what I could do because look, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, I just think it's an absolute fact. Government bureaucrat and government lawyers play dirty, and they exploit your patriotism, and they think you think you, you're going to sit there like a naive, law-abiding American go. My lawyer wouldn't, my, my government wouldn't do this to me. Oh, yes, they would, because they think you're guilty. So if they think you're guilty, they're going to blast you. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, available at Amazon.com and other booksellers. So, so how did you go about finding a lawyer? Because you're, well, you're taking I, on the FTC. I had a lot of, um, first of all, I was raised by two Detroit police officers, one of which was an inspector. So I had a lot of experience in my childhood around the law. And, and so I knew, I probably was ahead of the game coincidentally on that. And the second thing was, so, and also I spent a lot of time in surgery and cancer diagnostics. And, and so I wasn't intimidated, nor was I impressed with the federal government. Most people come up and go, oh, but you know, I was over bloody bodies for years. And so you deal with that. That's reality. The people that think, that, these people that take themselves so seriously, I, I, I really, it, it's kind of nauseating. <laughs> so I, did, I was like, I'm like, this, this, oh. How do you really feel? Well, it's oh, true. I'm sorry. It's absolutely true because, and I have a responsibility to say it because it's, it's not a joke. I mean, when it's your body on the table, it's your mother on the table, mm -hmm. you're not going to want these type of people messing with this. Mm -hmm. it, well, your turn will come, you know, but you just don't know it yet because you're still in the middle of your life. And, and, but I knew it because I was doing this way early in mine. So like when I spoke to Hippocow, there were two women that actually teared up in that audience. And I remember that because they were, they were medical people. So why did they tear up and get so upset? Because they understood. It's just, it's not empathy. Right? They have experience. Okay, everyone else doesn't have experience. They don't know about cancer tissue. They don't know about cutting it one cell thick. They don't know that the little bottle of stain to pop, make those cells pop costs $4,000 an ounce. They don't know that there's a shortage of people doing it. They don't know any of this stuff. It is really serious stuff. But it's, uh, it's frustrating because the public doesn't know. Well, I sh they shouldn't have to know. You know, but we have decided in the past 15 years that when we're sick, we should believe our congressmen, and that is a problem, and that's why things are such a mess. So somehow I found myself crosshaired in all this, but I, it really was just a choice. Um, so, so as far as, you know, so let's get back to lawyers, I guess. So the, the lawyer, the, so how I found lawyers, because of all that experience, and you know, and marketing comes. I knew that everything is relationships and it's no different regardless of what business it is. So I went to Washington truly with the mindset like it was the first day I approached a huge healthcare complex, you know, facility like the Emory or, you know, or, 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 or Beaumont or something, you know, in, in Michigan or so. So that is a complex organization. And so I didn't ever, ever ever run in saying help me save me or acting like an upset victim i was just one of them explaining my case and to see if they thought it was a political opportunity because what i learned i mean i i met with house commerce 
And they said to me, we can't have a hearing on the Federal Trade Commission because there's not a company that will come in here and talk about them because they're all scared to death. And I was like, well, here's the weird thing. This is why I'm a small company. So the dirty play of the SEC or the FTC or all these quote unquote independent agencies, they can't, they can't, do, they can't leverage fiduciary duties. I own the company 100%. They can't leverage uh, SEC uh, regulations. I'm, I'm private. Um, they can't, they can't regulate, they can't go after me for healthcare. So if we just got a perfect inspection, we got a, we had a zero demerit, perfect score three months before we closed. So we were clean and, and you better be clean when you take these people on because they will come after your family. And I'm not kidding because it's divide and conquer. And that means there's one of you and most of the public's not paying attention. And then you're going to be really upset and you're going to be seeing things and you're going to say them. And what's going to happen is people are going to go, shut up. Or they're going to say, I don't believe you, or quit making waves, or quit being a pain, or quit being crazy. But it's very much like being on fire and screaming, but no one can see the flames. It's like if you scream, they're not going to like you. If you don't scream, they're going to wonder why there's no problem. So you have to look for people that understand. So I found, uh, I jumped to the end, I found Cause of Action at the time was a... Um, really a, a, a non-profit law firm that wanted to fund uh, cases against government overreach and bullying. So that was good. And then they, you know, we broke up midway. <laughs> but then, because at the time, their behavior was a little uh, questionable to me. And, uh, and, and, and I'll just suffice it to say that when we, when we lost and the, and the commissioners overturned us and we had to go to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, that point, the FTC had said, you know, if I say it, it's doubtful. When the FTC says it, then people pay attention, right? And lawyers sitting there, you know, any major corporation anywhere in the country hear the FTC say, yes, um, we don't need to have a breach to be in violation. You don't have to have a victim to be in violation. You can just be have a vulnerable data system. Now, and that's where I stop and go, okay, anybody, who doesn't have a vulnerable system? Mm. Okay, so, so what the, suddenly my case was, the results of my case affected them, was no longer a roadkill story. And it was shocking to me the number of people that don't pay attention to these laws and how they impact the company. I mean, still tons of people don't that are CISOs or CIOs. They have no idea about this stuff still. I, I'm amazed. But, but it's the odds because the odds of the tree falling down on you are, are, are not huge. But the impact of these laws impact all these companies, not me, because my company's gone. But my case became really important. Because of that, Ropes and Gray picked it up pro bono because Ropes and Gray was the boutique sharp as hell firm and now that team has moved to Oric. Um, but they their brand really is okay if you want to take on the government we'll take them on because again most people haven't picked a lawyer most people haven't been in a government fight most people haven't had a breach so you said something in in your piece about you know not not finding a lawyer that had experience with the ftc um, so can you, can you expand on yeah, that? Yeah, so that's yeah, right. And so, so what happens is when you don't have that experience, you go to like the odds, right? So it's like, well, I don't know how the FTC thinks. My lawyer doesn't know how the FTC thinks. Think, the logical thing to do, one would have hoped and thought, was to get a lawyer that has worked at the FTC so they have relationships inside and they know how they tick. Biggest mistake anyone ever makes. Logical thing you'd think is a smart move. Here's the, the stuff that seems outside. Everyone wants everything so pretty and non-confrontational. You know, I'm sorry to break your heart. <laughs> but, you, know, you know, if you want to learn it the hard way, you know, go ahead, it's your dime. <laughs> but, but most of these attorneys that have worked at agencies are only interested in getting big pay, hourly pay wages from large corporations that are very interested in settling. It's just a game. So these people don't have experience with real litigation. Most people don't litigate with the government. So it's all, again, in that little nest. And if, that, and if that's what you want to be, and that's what your company's strategy is, and that's what's best for your company, there is nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, know what it is. You are not going to get a savvy 
challenging, courageous fighter almost ever out of an agency lawyer that's left and gone to big law. Because that is not what big law is about. <laughs> and that's not what those agencies are about. DC, and it's interesting because, you know, I, when I started writing these things six, seven years ago, the word swamp or uh, deep state or administrative state was not in the lexicon. And people use them now, they still don't know what they are. But to me, that's what that is. That is that is this, okay, I've worked at the agency for 20 years, I'm paid my dues, and I'm, I'm saving the world, and aren't I wonderful? And there's everyone around you that's only gonna agree with you and pat you on the back around there. You know, I've only made 120 to 150,000 a year, when if I went out to Big Law, I could be making it all a million. And so now's my chance, I'm gonna get out here, and, and why does Big Law want me? Well, because Big Law has big, corporate you know you see that go on and you're like well it's just this it's just this merry-go-round this is this little club and once you're in the club life is good but if you're not in the club don't go hire the club it's a choice most of us are not in the club okay so you look at like Microsoft or, or we just had Facebook getting that that fine well what really happened here how much of their revenue was that and less than half or 1%. Right, exactly. And how long did that last, right? And then, and then what, does, what do the FTC commissioners do? Oh, the whole new Republican appointed crowd, by the way. So let's forget that. You can just forget partisan. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it's, a, it's a publicity thing for them. They get to go on the news and say, oh, we're helping save the world. In the meantime, nothing's getting better. Everything's getting worse because, we, because that entire crowd of people is, is not, does not have the skill to do this. And, and so what I, the big point I really want to make when I was walking over here that I wanted to tell people it, it to step back is, look, again, most of us have not chosen lawyers. Most of us have, n have not been lawyers. And, 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 but most of us have chosen physicians so, or, or had them, right? Most of us have not had lawyers. Choosing a lawyer is like walking into a professional building of doctors where none of them have their specialties on the wall. And they're not going to tell you what they are. And they're going to tell you that they can probably do what you need. And you're going to find out your podiatrist fixed your heart valve only after you're out of the operating room. And that's a real problem. Because also, there's very little accountability within the law. I mean, it's real hard to sue for malpractice, especially here in Georgia and Alabama. And it's real hard to get the Bar Association to take anything. So, again, it's just be aware that you have to know these things to pick the right people. And I didn't know. I'm a very different person with my knowledge than I was 10 years ago. Um, and I just want people to understand that there's very little accountability. And that's with lawyers. Judges are the ones that make lawyers crazy. <laughs> I mean, judges are worse. <laughs> there's nothing better if you get a great lawyer and a great judge. Nothing better. Excellent. Very few good lawyers and good judges. Great, great insights. Any, any last comment you want to share? Um, well, that sure can't be my last comment, period. But for right now, for this thing, no, I think that's <laughs> the biggest. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is that uh, you have to do your homework. Oh, and I would say start doing this before anything happens to you because there's never you always need a good lawyer is so incredibly valuable that even if you don't have the government beaten down your door, you need to find one, and those are the things, you know, it's always great to be able to do that when you're not in panic mode. Well, Michael, so, that's that's really great advice, and, and I really appreciate you taking the time today. You've been on a fantastic journey that I think is going to, we're going to see the results of that in years to come uh, in the way things, uh, laws are being shaped. So I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you very much. Great to be here, thank you, sir. Cyber Reason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Cyber Reason, end cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.